Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pasco Community Baptist Church. We are so glad that you're able to join us this morning by way of the internet for our special uh, a Resurrection Day service here at the church. Uh, we've been worshiping God this morning and singing great Easter hymns and uh, just praising the Lord for his resurrection and the gift of eternal life that we have as a result of his resurrection. And we're, again, we're glad that you can join us this morning. I don't often do the special music on Sunday just before I preach, but on Easter Sunday, it's my privilege to be able to sing a very special song that has become a tradition in our church over the years, long before I came, and this is actually my 30th Easter Sunday here, and, uh, but uh, long before I came, this song was being sung on Easter. I know that uh, Mary Jane Bailey has sung it before. I know there's been a couple of Easter's in the 30 years when I was sick and Mary Jane had to sing it, and, uh, uh, but bef I think before me, if I'm not mistaken, it was a dear sister in Christ named Shirley Scaramella that used to sing it on Easter morning, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, had a beautiful, beautiful voice. I'm not sure I do it as much justice as Shirley would have, but uh, uh, because when I sing it, uh, Betty has to lower it about four notes down so that I can sing it, but, uh, uh, but I'm going to give it a try. It's an old song uh, written in uh, 19, actually it was published in 1942. It was written before that. It was actually published after the death uh, of the author, F.E. Uh, Weatherly. He died in 1929, and the song was published published in 1942, uh, but it's a great, uh, great song. Uh, Effie Weatherly uh, was a British poet and songwriter and lawyer and was known, uh, became known anyway, for two songs. He wrote a thousand of them, but he only had two. One of them is the one I'm singing this morning, The Holy City, and the other one is a famous old song called Oh Danny Boy. Uh, he wrote that one as well, and, uh, uh, but we're going to sing The Holy City this morning, and, and appreciate Betty playing for, for us this morning. <clears throat> Last night I lay a-sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, I thought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. I thought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. <clears throat> Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing. Hosanna in the highest to your king. <clears throat> and then I thought my dream was changed, the streets no longer rang. Hushed were the glad hosannas, the little children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery, the morn was cold and chill. As the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill, as the shadow of a cross arose, upon a lonely hill. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, hark how the angels sing. Hosanna in the highest, 
to your king. <clears throat> and once again the scene was changed, new earth it seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the tideless sea. The light of God was on its streets, the gates were open wide, and all who would might enter, and no one was denied. of moon or stars by night or sun to shine by day it was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away it was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, sing for the night is o'er. Hosanna in the heart. Hosanna forevermore. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna Before we get into the preaching of the Word of God, we have another Easter poem that we're going to have read to us this morning. Uh, this time, Ruth Miller is going to come and share a poem with us, and then we'll get right into the preaching this morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is with great joy that I share this poem with you that the Lord gave me several years ago. And the message in it is eternal. And may you hear the love of Jesus as I recite this to you. It's entitled, Golgotha. Your hands swung the hammer, my hands felt the pain. I gave up my right of lordship for your eternal gain. Your voices shouted curses, piercing like a sword. My voice breathed out forgiveness as you crucified your Lord. O daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. My life I've made a sacrifice to save and set you free. Your souls have been imprisoned by sin in darkest night. I've come to be your ransom and bring you to the light. The fullness of my father's wrath in fury was outpoured. He crushed me the apple of his eye, the son that he adored. How Golgotha trembled as loud thunder shook the sky. And the sun, when the, when the, I'm sorry, as loud thunder shook the sky, when the cry came, it is finished, and the Son of Man did die. I tasted hell's dread torment to open heaven's door. For you I took the punishment to bring you life forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Thank you, Ruth. We appreciate that. And, and uh, those of you who are watching by way of the Internet, we actually had a poem read earlier as well by Steve Woods, an Easter poem. And, uh, and I appreciate uh, these folks offering to use their talents for the Lord. It's important. If we have a talent that God has given us, we ought to be using it to glorify God. And so thank you, uh, both of you, this morning for the, uh, uh, for the poems you shared with us in the service. Now, if you take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. The Gospel of John in chapter 20. Okay, beginning in verse 24 of John chapter 20. Verse 24 of John 20 says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. That is, Thomas was not among the disciples the very first time that Jesus appeared to them after his resurrection. So Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again the disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it in my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. And we pray that through the work of your spirit, you'll speak to our hearts today. I pray that everybody listening will receive something from the scriptures that will be of great benefit in their walk with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first Easter Sunday morning was a time of incredible joy. Jesus had risen from the dead. Wednesday was the day of the funeral, but Sunday turned into a festival. It was almost too good to be true. The, dis the, the disciples could hardly take it in. One moment they were terribly downcast because their beloved master had been taken by cruel men and put to death. That was Wednesday, and then Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday had been dark days of mourning and sorrow, almost like death itself. But then came the first day of a new week. It was the beginning of the Christian era because it was the climax of God the Father's plan of redemption. Jesus rose from the dead in great triumph as proof that the sacrifice of his life on the cross had been accepted by the Father as the atonement for the sins of the world. What a, what a day that was. What excitement at seeing the empty tomb. And yet, by the end of that same evening, we learn from John's gospel that things were far from well from Christ's followers. If you go back in this chapter, notice verse 19. It says, Then the same day, that is the day of the resurrection, at evening, being the first day of the week, notice now, with the doors shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. 
Jesus had risen from the dead, and yet his closest followers were living in fear. You know, I sometimes wonder what God uh, thinks of human beings. We, we sometimes are very irrational. I think it's just part of our fallen nature. I mean, what could have happened in the minds of the disciples uh, for such a, a change of mood? From newly received hope to deep, deep gloom. Well, the answer lies in the fact that the disciples, although they had seen the empty tomb, they had yet to experience seeing the risen Lord. And oh yes, they had heard about the resurrection. They had even seen some of the evidences of it. There was the empty tomb. There was the discarded grave clothes. See, they had an intellectual knowledge, but they hadn't yet seen him personally. Now let's try to put ourselves into the disciples' shoes uh, to see what we can learn of the meaning of the resurrection. Looking back at the event from the standpoint of history, we can see the happy ending. But it was different for the disciples that first evening. They had passed through a tremendous upheaval. For three years, they had left home behind and left loved ones behind to follow Jesus. But now their dearest friend had suffered and died on a Roman cross like a common criminal. And all the city was talking about it. The Jewish authorities had plotted the overthrow of the Lord. And the disciples had reason to believe that their own safety was at considerable risk. And so it's no wonder that they took refuge behind closed doors. You know, when, when people go through a traumatic experience, it often results in their being kind of disoriented. So, so, so let's not forget that the disciples had suffered the bereavement of their dearest friend. Emotionally, they were thoroughly confused, and we need to be uh, careful in judging them. You know, it, it's very easy to pass judgment on people, especially if we haven't passed through their experience. People who have lost a loved one, or lost their job, or lost a position of responsibility, often go through a valley of bereavement which cannot be understood secondhand. And it requires a true friend to stand by them. And so when our opportunity comes to be that true friend, let's be sure to rise to the occasion. The disciples were disappointed and despondent behind their locked doors. But then, like a, a shaft of sunlight piercing the gloom, we read the, the heartwarming words as verse 19 continues, then the same day at evening being the first day of the week, uh, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst. And that right there is God's answer to the need of mankind. The risen presence of Jesus is the remedy for our perplexity of not being able to understand what's happening to us. He blows away the fog of confusion with the words that he says to them at the end of verse 19, peace be unto you and he gives a sense of purpose for the future now one of the disciples was missing from that safe house in Jerusalem that evening as we read a moment ago that was Thomas 
Now, we don't know a great deal about him, but it does seem that he was a, a natural pessimist. And he really has, you know, had some bad press, right? People refer to him as Doubting uh, Thomas. If something could go wrong, Thomas was the one who believed that sure enough it would go wrong. He, he seemed to have a sense of foreboding. For instance, when Jesus heard that his friend Lazarus had died in Bethany, and Jesus announced that he would go there. You know what Thomas' response was? John eleven sixteen. he said, Let us go also, that we may die with him. Very pessimistic. But although Thomas may have been a pessimist, I'll tell you one thing, he didn't lack courage. He loved Jesus, and although he thought he was going to die... He was still willing to go with Jesus to Bethany and die with him while the other disciples seemed hesitant and afraid. But for some reason, Thomas had been absent on that first Easter uh, Sunday when, when Jesus appeared to the disciples as a group. And we can only guess why he wasn't present. But I wonder, could it have been because he had fallen into a, into a state of spiritual despondency and he just wanted to retire to his shell and grieve by himself? Maybe he just felt like he needed some alone time. And there are times when it can be the right thing to withdraw and, 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 and kind of think things through for, our, for ourselves but only up to a point, only up to a point. Because we then have to emerge from our private world to test our, our conclusions in the fellowship of believers, to check that we haven't gone off on a, tan a tangent. You know, no one person is a sole source of the truth and it requires humility to admit that perhaps uh, there's just a possibility that we, have, we might have gotten it wrong in the, in the trauma of life-shattered dreams. And a, a quiet time of sharing with a trusted Christian friend can go a long way to restoring the balance. Now, happily for Thomas, he did return to the fellowship of the band of, uh, of disciples, although he was still in the gloom of deep despair. But what a surprise was in store for him. As he entered the room, he was greeted by the words, in verse 25, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas was absolutely astonished. It, it, it just couldn't be true. He, he couldn't bring himself to believe it. And he put into words the skepticism and the doubt that he felt there in verse 25. He says, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. He couldn't have stated his conditions for believing any more clearly than that. Just hearing about Jesus wasn't going to be sufficient to move Thomas from doubt to faith. He insisted that the other senses of sight and touch be brought, in, brought to bear. He wanted to see with his own eyes. He, he wants to touch the, the wound marks in his fingers. He wanted tangible evidence. And his attitude is, if the risen Christ will satisfy these demands, then I will believe. But nothing less will do. And what happens next is amazing. The disciples certainly heard Thomas's words, but there was also an unseen listener as well. 
And that's something we all need to remember. The risen but unseen Christ witnessed Thomas's dogmatic statement of doubt, uh, just as he knows ours, whether they're spoken or, or only in thought. And thank God for that. Thank God he knows the frailty of our human nature better than we know it ourselves. And of course he understands because he is our creator. And while we don't have uh, the right to make outrageous demands uh, on God to help us uh, with our unbelief, there is no doubt that he does understand and he does care, especially if we're truly honest in our search for the truth and we're not just play acting. Now the first appearance of Jesus minus Thomas was on Easter Sunday. And you might expect that Thomas's outburst of doubt upon hearing from the disciples about that first appearance of Jesus would have resulted, you think it would have resulted in a further appearance of Jesus there and then. But that's not what happened. You see, God's timing in dealing with people is, is his own affair. Thomas was left to reflect on those words of doubt that he made for a whole nother week. A whole week. And I, I have to think that that was not a very happy week. Day after day, he heard the, the repeated stories of Christ's appearances, and he waited for Christ to, to come again so that he might uh, be kind of put out of his uh, misery. That week must have dragged as he turned the issues in his mind over and over again, tossed between hope and fear, doubt and faith, wondering if he would ever be able to share in that which the other disciples had experienced. But Thomas wasn't to be disappointed. A week later, the disciples, with Thomas present this time, were gathered together behind locked doors. The same place, the same circumstances, seeking refuge from the authorities. And then came that wonderful statement in verse uh, 26. It says, Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And at that point, Jesus turns to Thomas and begins a conversation with him. Now you have to wonder how Thomas felt when Jesus turned to him. Did he think he was in for a uh, severe scolding because of his unbelief? But that's not what happened. You see, our, our Savior doesn't treat an honest seeker like that. Jesus doesn't reject anyone who really seeks him. Because he had come to restore and to strengthen the seeker. Jesus is a model of gentleness and patience with Thomas. His words uh, to Thomas, of course, they're based on the conditions for believing that Thomas had made. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I can see the marks of the nails and put my fingers in those uh, marks and I can put my hand in his side where the spear went in. I won't believe unless I can do that. And so Jesus said, all right, Thomas, go ahead. Here's my hands. Put your fingers where the nails were. Here's my side. Put your, put your hand where the spear was. Now think about this. Think about this. He says to him, see and feel for yourself. This is the Lord of glory. Risen from the dead. Miraculously appearing in bodily form. And offering Thomas a personal inspection of the marks of the crucifixion. You talk about the humility of the Savior. 
But the invitation to Thomas to make the test that he demanded was never taken up. There was no need. Thomas was overcome with love and devotion. All he could say was, my Lord and my God. And Jesus urges him to stop his doubting and instead believe. And that's what happened. In a moment of time, he made the transition from doubt to faith. And although we are all individuals and our circumstances differ, we are all in need of making that same journey into faith. If you're familiar with the name John Wesley from church history, a famous preacher from many, many years ago, you know that John Wesley's journey was like an obstacle course. As a young man at university, he had a real desire to serve God. And through the self-discipline and the rules of an organization he belonged to that called themselves the Holy Club, he tried on his own to make progress to a knowledge of God, wrongly thinking that, was, that it was a matter of good works and self-effort. But with all his self-effort and all his good works, in the end, he had no assurance of his sins being forgiven. No assurance of eternal life. And yet, at the end of those college days, he entered ordained ministry and came to serve as a missionary in the American colonies. But he still lacked certainty about his faith and about his salvation. He was convinced that salvation was a process that you had to work for in order to achieve. Well, just two days before the turning point in his life, he heard a powerful sermon on trusting in Christ alone for salvation. Not good works, not religious deeds, not salvation, not uh, self-effort, but salvation in Christ alone. But he just couldn't take it in. In his own words, he said this, I could not understand. I could not understand how this faith should be given in a moment. How a man could at once be turned from darkness to light, from sin and misery to righteousness and joy. But his biographer says that John Wesley found the answer by turning to the Acts of the Apostles. And there he found that almost all conversions which were recorded in the book of Acts were instantaneous. And two days later, at a meeting uh, at a church on Aldersgate Street in London, he had the same experience that Thomas had, that of putting his faith and his trust in the risen Lord for salvation. And he recorded that day in his journal. He wrote, about a quarter before nine, I felt my heart strangely warm, and I trusted in Christ and Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins and saved me. Thomas had doubted Christ's resurrection. But when he became sure, his surrender was complete. He, like John Wesley, and like all true Christians, overcame his doubt and found the wonder and joy of having Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. See, the other disciples had already had their encounter with Jesus, but they couldn't believe for Thomas. 
he had to make that decision for himself. And this is something that's still true today. Each of us have to hear the words that Jesus addressed to Thomas as if he were saying them right to us. The words that are found where Jesus says, Be not faithless, but believing. That is, stop your doubting and believe. And that right there was the greatest need of Thomas and that's the greatest need of every person in the world. And although we can't see him and we can't touch him and his resurrection appearances are no longer in human form, he is just as real to those uh, who seek after him and hear his words and put their trust in him today just as real as he was back then, those 2,000 years ago. You see, for Thomas, seeing was believing. But for Christians today, believing is seeing. And that's why Jesus says in verse 29, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The story of Thomas is a moving example of God's dealing with with human beings. He's been dubbed as doubting Thomas, and he did doubt, but it was an honest doubt, and he was prepared to face up to the evidence. The, the story of Thomas gives hope to doubters. If only they will believe the evidence and take the step of putting their faith in Jesus. The words of Jesus to us today, uh, his word is the same as it was to Thomas. Be not faithless, but believing. Stop doubting and believe. And I pray that if you've never done so before, that today you will call out to Christ and put your faith and your trust in this risen, living Savior thereby making it possible for you to call him the same thing Thomas ended up calling him, my Lord and my God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. And we thank you that in your word, you, you've given us this account of doubting Thomas meeting the risen Lord. And I pray, Father, that, uh, that as Thomas put his faith in the risen Lord, that there would not be one single person who's hearing me today, whether it's here in the church house or by way of the internet, Lord, I pray that not one single person would come to the end of this service without putting their faith and their trust in this risen, living Lord. Father, help them to see this is their greatest need, that they need Jesus more than they need anything else. Because only in him can we find forgiveness. And only in him can we find eternal life. That forgiveness was paid for on the cross. And that eternal life is provided by his resurrection. And so we thank you that this morning he is alive. And for those of us who, ex who have experienced personal faith in the risen Savior. Those of us who have a personal relationship with God through faith in Christ. Lord, help us to faithfully proclaim to this world that Jesus is alive and that he can change people's lives forever. Thank you again for the joy of Easter, but thank you for the hope that it gives us beyond this life, the hope of eternity with you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.